Let me just open, just to kind of set up this uh, chapter. Paul's, this is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and what it unlocks is one of the greatest secrets, you guys, in life and in ministry to all believers. And you know what that is? God's power is channeled through our weakness. That's what we're going to see. If you stick with this, uh, this chapter as we go verse by verse, you're going to see that's what this is uh, talking about in this second chapter. Um, strength and weakness. And there's a central message for, for the second Corinthians. The, throughout the letter, Paul kind of turns upside down uh, this natural expectations of how life works. And he's um, contrary to what the world believes, he, he looks at it and he says, you know what, God can use us at our lowest point, despised how we are, how weak we are, he can still accomplish his purpose through us in those moments. So that's what we're gonna learn. And tonight in 2 Corinthians, it tells us the comfort that comes through affliction. And it's the sufficiency that comes through insufficiency. And life through death. And blessings through suffering. And um, salvation through grief and abundance through poverty, and also boasting through hardship. And as we continue in this in, uh, chapter, 2 Corinthians, we'll get to chapter 12 later on, and it's going to talk about God's power is made perfect in our weakness. So I'm going to land on a cute few verses tonight. We're only going to probably get through 10 verses, to be honest with you tonight, because there's so much to unpack. And what's interesting is when you study God's word, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, I'm looking at 2 Corinthians. I'm not getting a lot out of it. I can do these 24 verses in, in no time. It's, it's okay. It's because it's, it's a letter that he's writ, written to the Corinthians. And then God started to reveal to me. I'm like, I'm not even going to get through 10 verses tonight. So let's see how far we get, okay? Um, but the global message of 2 Corinthians for today, the letter, it kind of provides us this comfort of hope and, um, and believers to not only to us, uh, in the United States, but around the world. And God's way of measuring success is entirely different than the way the world looks at it, right? Can we, can we amen that? God doesn't look at success the way that the world looks at it. In many places today, the, the church is, is publicly marginalized, right? Because it's, it's looked at as silly. Church is looked at as silly, and, and we're, or it's persecuted because it seems threatening, or simply ignore because it seemed irrelevant. But we're not judged by the world standards, right? We're, we're, influenced, we're influenced by what God sees. So the vision of heaven, what God sees in the church, you guys, is precisely right. It is exactly the places that we need to do to, to be, to go through adversity and using the Holy Spirit and knowing that the Holy Spirit is alive and the gospel will be spread in our time, right? So let me pray this, and then we're going to get right into it. Heavenly Father, I just pray you left us 66 love letters, and it's called the Bible. So as we go through chapter two, one of the letters, one of the chapters in this love letters, I pray that it would speak to each and every person here tonight, that not only that we would speak, it would speak to us love, but we would have an application to spread this word, that it would use that word to speak into someone else's life. So anoint me, I've done all the studying, move things off my page that doesn't, doesn't need to be there, and I just invite the Holy Spirit to be the teacher tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. So let's just look at verse number one, and I'm going to kind of unpack this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Acacia. Now, let me just stop right there. Right away, Paul gives himself a title. He says, Apostle of Christ Jesus. That's what he gave himself a title. He said, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. The Greek word for apostle comes from a verb, and that means to send out. It was used in the Old Testament for persons that had the authority to send people out, who sent them out. Okay, so when Paul was first writing, remember when he first wrote, when we did 1 Corinthians, he wrote in chapter 12 that he said, are all apostles, remember he said that, are all apostles, are all evangelists, do all perform miracles? He was asking that question, not for an answer, he was asking a rhetorical question. 
But he said, you know the answer is no. Not everybody is called to be an apostle, right? So Paul was saying, I am an apostle, and I was sent here to do the will of God. Now, God didn't call all of us to be apostles, right? If I were writing a letter to the church, if I was writing a letter to Valley Vegas Church, I would say, Jerry, pastor by the will of God. That's what I would say. I couldn't really say, Jerry, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. That's not my title, and that's what, not what God is using me for in this body. Does that make sense? So not all of us are apostles, but some of us are Frank the mechanic by the will of God, right? Some of us are John the fisherman by the will of God. Some of us, Mike the car salesman by the will of God. For God has called us into all types of occupations, you guys. The important thing is to remember, this is why I want you to remember, I am what I am by the will of God. I am what I am by the will of God. I am doing what God has willed me to do. And it's marvelous, it's exciting when you can say, think about this, when concerning your life, concerning your life, when you can say, I am walking according to the will of God and the plan that God has for me. Wouldn't that be exciting if you said, I know this is the plans that he has for me and I can walk in that will? So that's whatever it is that I am, I am by the will of God. So Paul's defense is he's saying, I'm an apostle of the ministry. He's saying that. And, and the, it was reflected because the Holy Spirit was guiding Paul. Look at verse number two. Look at what happens next. He says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He did a little wordplay there. In Greek, the greeting was hello, right? In the Greek word, that's cheering. And then in Christians, they would say grace. The Greek word for that is keros. So think of it this way. When you say keros, that means peace. Peace is the profound well-being that comes from resting in God's sovereignty and mercy. So if I said hello and somebody said peace, not that kind of peace, guy. But if I said peace, I'm saying to you the profound well-being that comes from resting in God's sovereignty and mercy. So he answers them. That little scripture right there or that little verse, he's answering with peace. He didn't say hello. He said peace. That makes sense? So look at verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Now, I'm going to talk a lot tonight. I'm setting this up for comfort. We're going to be talking. We're going to spend some time on this. But Paul offers praise to God, and he introduces the main themes to the following. He said, God the Father... And he said, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the titles that he used is Yahweh's relationship, right? Yahweh's relationship to Jesus, Jesus' relationships to his people. That's what verse number three says. Now watch verse number four. Who comforts us in most of our afflictions. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Maybe my turn. He it comforts us in the majority of our afflictions. No, no, no. Okay, my Bible must be, who comforts us in some of our afflictions. No, no. It, okay, your Bible's different. Wait, it says he comforts us in what? All of our afflictions. Now he answers why he does that in the very next sentence, right? So that we will be able to comfort those who are in most of their afflictions. No, no, no. He says he does that to comfort us for those who are in are, are any afflictions with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by who? By God. And then verse 5 says, For just as the suffering of Christ are ours in abundance, so also are comfort in abundance through Christ. Now, let me just say this part, and then I'm going to tie all those five or six verses. We're going to hit one more verse, and I'll tie those together. This is not refers, to, not refers to Jesus' unique atonement for sin, but this is Paul's suffering that, and an invitation of Christ. So Paul endured these sufferings with faithfulness to God and for the sake of God's people, all right? So let's read six. Verse number six says, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, or if we are com comfort, com comforted. 
It is for your comfort, which is effective. And the, everybody underline that word because patience. Some of us right now need to just hit that word. Patience, enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. Now, let's tie all this together. Paul is speaking about the afflictions that he had, that he's experienced, and the sufferings that he, that he had experienced, and the tribulations that he experienced. And what happens to us, you guys, we have a difficult time, if we're being honest, right? We have a difficult time, like, why would God allow us suffering? Why would God allow us to have these, go through these trials and this tribulation? Why would God let us be afflicted? We have this question that we want to ask because we, as Christians, say we know God is love, right? We know that God controls the circumstances and the surroundings around us. So why would he allow us to go through these, these uh, turmoils and these afflictions? And we tend to say because we believe that God is love and that he's, he understands all these things and, and, and we try to get ourselves to answer that why question. Why would a loving God allow us, if he loves me, to be afflicted? And Paul says, this is what he says, so pay attention. He said that is experiencing these things in order that he might also experience the comfort of God so that he would be able to comfort others with the same comfort that he receives. Does that make sense? Let me do it my Ebonics way. You go through it so you can go through it so you can help those that's gone through it. You got it? I'm gonna tie that one back in a little bit later. So look, so for their sakes, so much as his own, that God would allow these things to happen to him for, for him to be able to use it as a ministry opportunity. Sometimes you're going through the situations and circumstances for a ministry opportunity, and you're looking at it because you can relate to it. Me, as I look at my own life, I realize that God has allowed me to go through a lot of difficult things when I was uh, walking with the Lord. And I experienced uh, those things, I believe, to, so I can understand and sympathize with those in ministries for those people that are going through the same or similar things and going through those difficulties. Had I not gone through those things myself, you guys, I wouldn't have an understanding of the people's need. You know, I shared a story where, where we have military people here, and I've never been in the military. I elected to go try to play professional basketball in Mexico versus going to the military. So when people ask me questions about the military, I know I have Christian brothers and sisters that served in the military that I can say, you know what, let me talk, let them talk to this person. They can probably explain it a lot better than me. I didn't experience that. But I did have an experience, the sudden death of my father. I lost my mother this year. Um, I had a shock of my 14-year-old nephew committed suicide. I had my sister-in-law that lost her life to cancer. I've experienced being broke where I didn't know where I was going to eat my next meal. So I understand through my own personal experiences why now I can relate to people that's been in those situations. If you lost a mom, I lost a mom. I can talk to you about it. You lost your dad, I lost a dad. I can talk to you about it. Does that make sense? So some of those sufferings that we go through is a ministry opportunity. And Paul said he could relate. He said, I know the sufferings. I know the afflictions. I know the tribulations. I've been there. And now he says, but I can comfort them through that time. So while I was there, he said, God proved his faithfulness to me. God saw me through it and God provided me strength. Right? God provided me the comfort that I needed so I'm able to comfort those who needed to be comforted. So you go through it so you can go through it so you can help those that gone through it. Does that now make, that make sense? That demonics? All right, somebody wrote that down. Don't, don't write that down. <laughs> Let's pick up verse number seven. And our hope for you is firmly grounded knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. So the opponents, remember his enemies, Paul's enemies, they were saying, you know what, Paul's 
suffering disqualifies him to be an apostle. He can't call himself an apostle and experience those sufferings. But Paul is saying, you know what? God uses his suffering to strengthen other believers. He saw that foresight already. Some of us look at our sufferings like, why me? Why am I going through this, Lord? Why is another situation? And then we start to lose our faith in God altogether. And then some have sadly walked away from the very person that can provide the need. I walked away from that. So we have to be careful. This verse, that's why I say stick around for 2 Corinthians. One of my favorite verses in 2 Corinthians is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So we walk by faith, not by sight. We're going to talk about that one. I don't know if I'm teaching it, but that's my favorite verse in the Bible. That's my life verse. It's in my office. It's at my house. It's on my motorcycle. It's, that's my verse. Walk by faith, not by sight. So my dad explained it to me. I was thinking when I, that verse, how it became my life first. I was wondering, how does you walk by faith and not by sight? And my dad said, and it, I, I shared this story. He said, when you get paid, do you say, oh, Lord, please, Lord, let my check come. Please, Lord, let my check come. Please, Lord, Lord, I hope my check comes. And I was like, no. He said, or do you say, when I get my check, I'm going to spend it on this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a little bit away. And I said, the latter. And he said, Jerry, you haven't seen your check yet, and you've already spent it. And I was like, he said, that's walking by faith without sight, and not by sight. And I always stuck in my mind all these years later that he said that to me, and it reminds me how I activate my, my faith. Some of you guys need to hear that. It's already done. You've already proclaimed it, confessed it. I'm on, when I get my check, I'm going to spend it on this rent. I'm going to pay this little bill. I'm going to put a little bit away, and you haven't even seen your check yet. But your faith is already spinning the wheels, and you know it's already done. That's how we have to work in God's kingdom. We have to believe God is who he says he is, and, it, and your faith is activated by that. Amen? Yeah, God gave, gave God a praise clap. That's his words. <laughs> so for verse number eight, for we do not want to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we would despair even of life. Now, it's felt that Paul wrote this um, after this experience he had. So you'd have to go back and look at Acts verse uh, 19, chapter 19. Uh, look, at, look at that and read kind of the later portion of that. And here's the, the story. There was a, a, a gentleman named Demetrius. He was a silversmith. And um, he called together all these trades and he said, hey, fellas, do you realize that uh, this new teaching that's being taught over here, it's kind of kind of mess with our pocketbooks. He was looking about the business um, piece of it. Um, and he said, if this gospel gets spread all over this uh, Ephesus church, it's going to destroy our business. And they said, We're, our livelihood, the selling of our relics, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. And our profits are going to be gone. So they grabbed a couple of uh, Paul's disciples. Remember, if you know the story, they called, uh, grabbed a couple of his disciples and they drug them into this big arena in Ephesus, and they begin to start this riot. So they're just, it's going crazy. It's a mob. It's a show. And one of the fellows in Macedonia attempted to speak to the crowd, and it says that all of them begin for a space of two hours a chant. And the chant was, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, some translation says Diana. I've seen that word, Diana. Um, but there's, imagine two hours of somebody screaming this in this arena and this, this thing going crazy. So he said, Paul said, he wanted to go in there. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. He wanted to go in there. There's a mob. There's a riot. These people are chanting. They want to kill him. And Paul is still saying, I want to go in there. Who is that for? Some of you guys in our situation right now that you're paralyzed, you're frozen by that fear, and God is saying, go ahead and step in. I got you. Now, his people told him, wait, nope, they're going to tear you apart. You don't want to go in there. And he listened to them, and he, he departed. He fled from Ephesus, and he went down because he said, well, my life's in jeopardy. But he was, his first reaction was to go step in there. I don't know if that would have been my first reaction, but that was his. 
He knew his life was in jeopardy and he knew that he had, he left. So they think he wrote this epistle right after that experience. So it was a frenzy. Think about that. Paul really thought this was the end. Here's what I'm getting at. In our circumstances and situations, you guys, I think we've all been there to some degree where we really felt like this is it. Like, Lord, I, I can't do it anymore. Whatever that is, we've been at that, that finish line and you're like, I just can't even get across it. I don't know how I can even gather the strength to get across the next step. I can't do it on my own. And I know personally, as I said, in my own personal life, I've been there before. I've been there where, and it seems like it's my own fault, if I'm being honest, because every time I feel like God gives me the will, I go, well, I'm trying to give him the will. I take it back and I start driving. I got it from here, God. Like I got it. And then I just run right into the ditch and I'm back on my knees and I'm praying like, Lord, what's going on? But can we say the same thing, church? Are we ready to face our circumstances with that, that fire and that tenacity and saying like, you know what, Lord, I'm going to finish the race. Can we say that as a church? Ask yourself that, that question in your heart. In verse number nine, he says, indeed, we have sentenced, we have the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now, I believe that many times in many different areas, God brings us, like I said, either financially through our own resources, perhaps right to the wall where we just feel like we're right at the end and there's no place to go. And you feel like giving up. My, my advice, you guys, is don't give up. Finish the race. Because your strength comes from him, not from your own. If you try it on your own, you're gonna be like Pastor Jerry off in the ditch somewhere trying to figure it out and back on your knees. But if you rely on him and his his abilities, then his strength comes from him and it will get you to that finish line. Now, I don't even recommend doing this Christian life alone. I know we've talked about that to you guys. It's like, you got to have battle buddies. You got to have somebody that's really, truly in your corner. You know, some people say five. I say at least get three. Get three battle buddies. I think five is probably the ultimate number. If you can get five people but get a solid three people that you can call when you're about to give up, when you're about to quit, when you need prayer, when you know, need somebody to speak life into you and call that person. We tell, call it call before you fall, right? Make that phone call first to that person. How many right now boldly can say I have three battle buddies? Raise your hand. Oh, pray. this is a great, I'm glad I'm here. Battle buddies. So now, since you guys all have one, tell your friends to get battle buddies. Tell the people that they need battle buddies. You can't do this life by yourself. As you know, I discovered something that many times when I get to that point of where I want to get up, many times when I get to that point, that God shows up right then and there. God is always in my life right at the perfect time that I need him. But it's always when I tend to run out of my strength and my energy. It's, it's really when I have to literally surrender it all. You can't surrender you guys like this, right? Even in the movies, what do they say? You, you put your hands up. Everything's got to fall off when you put your hands up. You're not holding on to any of those things. So when I finally learned how, to, I didn't even do this. You know what I did? I did this. Like, I'm going to drop anything that's in my hands. I'm not going to put it back in my hand. I'm going to surrender everything. A classic example, this is where we're going to spend the most of the rest of our time. A classic example of this is in the Old Testament. A fellow named Jacob who received his birth name because of the incident that took place. Maybe you guys have followed the story. If you're not, listen carefully. He was the second twin that was born and he was, uh, uh, his mother was Rachel expecting these twins. And of course, they didn't have sonograms back then. So she didn't know she was having twins. They couldn't hear two heartbeats. And she didn't know that she was carrying these twins, but she had a horrible, horrible pregnancy. 
She said, this is what is going on. It was bad. And God said to her, there are two nations in your womb and they're different from each other. Remember, they're not identical twins. They're fraternal twins. Two nations in a room, diverse, fighting each other. So poor Rachel, these two brothers were going at it in the womb. Think about that. And then when one was born, the first one was born, he was covered with hair. So guess what his name was? Well, it's translated Harry too. Harry, Esau was his name. Esau, right? But it was Harry, that's what it was. And then the twin was born and he was ready to continue to fight, you guys, even after the womb. It said the first thing he did was reach up and grab Esau's heel. And they said, look at this little heel catcher is what they called him. And guess what his name was? Jacob, right? Guess what Jacob means? Heel catcher. Now, here's a translation that's a little more loosely. It could be called dirty, rotten thief or dirty, sneaky thief. That'd be a tough name in school. Dirty, sneaky thief here. <laughs> That'd be a bad name in school. Are you? But the conflict between these brothers continued for their lifetime. Dirty, sneaky thief. And his brother took advantage of, uh, he took advantage of his brother. Um, later, he deceives his father, stole the blessings from the family. Um, it just goes on and on. So if you, pick, if you read that story, it's a, it's a doozy. And when the brother of Esau found that out that Jacob had stolen the blessings, he said, my dad's about to die. And as soon as he's dead, I'm going to kill that rat. That's what he said. I've had it with him. I'm going to kill him. And Jacob, Jacob was more like the mama's boy. He was kind of like more closer to mom. And Esau was more like the hunter, the rugged outdoor uh, individualist, right? But he said, I'm going to kill him. He's dead. So the mother says, hey, son, um, you might want to leave because he's going to kill you. And so he goes 800 miles away to her brother's house. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on there. You guys probably know this story. He's, he's trying to get married seven years. It's the, it's the whole story. But let's fast forward, spend time in the word of God and look at that story though. But he, as he goes to his brother's house, as we fast forward, he sets up things because suddenly he gets word from scouts that his brother Esau with 200 warriors was coming to get him, right? And remember, he ran away from that. So he's like, he's going to kill me. He's got 200 people with him. So what does he do? Says he, he took off um, to get this guy. Well, here's the thing. He, what he took to get this guy to the end of his, himself. This is a part that I kind of underline for us. What does it take to get us to the end of ourself? I mentioned that it takes us to this, this journey that we're going through that we said, man, I've had enough. I want to give up. I want to stop. And that can work both ways, you guys. Sometimes we're struggling with something and we had enough of that addiction or that struggle and that fight and we're like, I want to give up here. And sometimes we just have been beat up by life circumstances and, and situations and we're saying the same thing. I just feel tired and I'm beat up about it. But when he sees this story, he, because he was so clever, he was so resourceful, God had to deal with him in a heavy way, and he got out of line. He can't go back. He's at the, that line. He can't go forward, and he can't go back. He's stuck, and we've been there. It's a, it's a point that we're going to get to that you're on the line, and you can't go either way. Forward, you're in trouble. Backward, you're in trouble. Now, according to Scripture, if you ask for a blessing, you're acknowledging superiority of the other party as a lesser, and, that's, and that someone's lesser is always greater than you are. Let me say that again. In Scripture, if you're asking for a blessing, you're acknowledging the superiority of the other party as the lesser is always blessed by the greater. Does that make sense? You read that in scripture. So when he's asking for a blessing, he's asking God, he's admitting that I am defeated. I am done. I am defeated. I need you. So when, this is a blessing that we're asking for. 
He's, he's saying, I'm defeated. Please bless me. And it says, an angel of the Lord said, what is your name? And he said, dirty, sneaky thief. Dirty, sneaky thief, right? But look at what the angel said. He says, you won't be dirty, sneaky thief anymore, but you will be a man governed by God of Israel and a man of God. He was brought to the end of himself, but when he was brought to the beginning of the whole new dimension of life, which is a glorious victory day for Jacob, when he was brought to the end of himself, he was brought to the beginning, right? It's not the end, it's the beginning. So as we discover in ourselves the place where we wanna give up and where we're forced to give up, when there's despair, when there's things that are not lining up with it, when we feel like this is it, I've had it, this is the end, I just have to give up, that is the place where God then has an opportunity of working. It's, it's not scripture, it's a poem. It's a poem. But it's the, it, it has so much more truth in it than scripture. And that is, I want to put this on the screen. Maybe you want to take this down. Man's extremities are God's opportunities. Right? When I come to extremities in my own self and I can't go any further that is the place where I have an opportunity for God to work the most in my life when I get to that brick wall. My dad used to say, you're walking backwards down a one-way street. At some point, you're gonna to get to the end, right? And when I find that God often brings me out of that place, it's usually in the order that he might work, not that I might work, not because of my nature, God often brings me to that place before he can work because he knows that basically I'm that guy that's, I'm the pretty self-confident guy. I'm the person, I don't know if you guys can follow with me. I'm the guy that won't give up. I'll try everything over and over and over again, right? I don't read the directions when they come out. I look at the box and I'm like, that looks like the TV goes, that, that, that's me. I'm gonna live life on the edge. That's why there's 15 screws left over. <laughs> I'll have to call Bob to come help me sometimes. But that's me. I live life on there. How many are like that? How many are like you just keep, you're not going to give up. I'm that person. I'm not going to quit. I'm tough. I'm strong. I can do this. But usually it's in that point where my self-confidence is dramatically weakened. My self-confidence is, is nothing compared to what God can do in my life. So when I feel like I can handle that situation and I want to try to do that on my own, God reminds me who he is. But, everybody say but. But you have to have a relationship with God. You have to have a relationship to one that can do these things, right? So let me say this. This is the, the, I think I put this up here too. Let's see if we have that up there for you guys. This is the, well, let me read verse, not yet. Let me read verse number 10. Who delivered us from great peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope and he will deliver us. The biblical, let me give you a little biblical description of what hope is, and that's what I want to put up on the screen. Maybe you can jot this down. What biblical hope is. Biblical hope is absolute confidence in God's promises for the future based on his faithfulness in the past. Biblical hope is absolute confidence confidence in God's promises for the future. And we can base that, you guys, on his faithfulness of what he's done in the past. When we pick up, we're going to talk about Paul's integrity next and what he's done in there. But let me just say this. 2024, I was, I was looking at a couple of my friends and 
California and, and, and they were sharing stories with me. And as a pastor, you know, I talk to other pastors and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are, what are they going through? What is the season in? Are they experiencing the same thing in our churches as, as, as um, we are within, maybe in their churches? And um, one of the common things that I'm, I'm seeing is that this watered down gospel, that's what my pastor friends say, like, nobody wants to speak the truth anymore. No one wants to stand on God's word. We're kind of like making everything feel good. And, and the Bible is not, if you read the Bible thoroughly, there is a heaven and a hell. And you're going to one of them. I don't care who you are, every knee will bow. There is a heaven and a hell. And I would be remiss if I just did not give everybody an opportunity when I stand up here to have an opportunity to share that relationship with God. I'm going to call the worship team out. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Christ before. I mean, the, the, my heart aches, you guys, because I have family members that don't that are walking this thin line a lukewarm Christian. They're, they're, there's no boldness in there. There's a, a, if you offend people, there's a, a tendency to step back as Christians. This is a time we need to step forward. This is a time to be bold. If they shut us down, they shut us down. But God's word will not come back void and he will not be silenced. Right? He's, he's not going to be silenced. So if you don't know Christ, I just want, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want you to raise your hand and I'm going to lead you through a prayer. In church, we can lead them through a prayer. But just lift your hand up so I know who I'm praying for. But this is just that boldness to say, Lord, I believe you are who you are, who you say you are. I believe that you died on the cross. I see your hand back there. Anybody else want to join this one? Two people, I see your hand up here. So just say this, I see your hand back there. In your heart, because this is eternity. This is for the life, this is a relationship with God. And you can assure, because we just read his promises, right? He says this, all you have to do is accept me in your heart. And then, then start following him, start walking on the cross. Get those battle buddies with you to help you navigate through life. So church, help us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you died and rose again. And I invite you into my heart. Walk with me. Show me my ways. Let it be your ways. Today I walk out of here not the same as when I walked in. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I ask for protection in my life as I follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen. Did you get something out of it, guys? All right, would you stand and worship with us? God bless you guys.